What up viewers, it's another episode of Advanced Sci-Fi Civilizations Too Stupid To Really Exist. And thanks so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video. Prepare to take a knee and contemplate one of the dumbest human civilizations we've encountered yet. It's the Novans. From After Earth and the 1000 AE Universe. Far in the future, humanity has long abandoned Earth after ruining it with the usual list of environmental calamities, taking up residence on their new homeworld Nova Prime, a harsh desert world which unfortunately is also highly valued by a hostile alien race, the Skrull, who are dropping off genetically engineered beasts called the Ursa, an apparent attempt to kill the Novans or at least get them to move on. Standing against them is the United Ranger Corps and their most prominent member and Prime Commander, Cypher Rage. <laughs> Yeah, nah, that's not happening. Will, I'm gonna call you Will. Will discovered years ago that he has the ability to battle the Ursa without experiencing fear, which makes it next to impossible for the Ursa to even register him as a threat. This phenomena is known as ghosting. This phenomenon is known as ghosting, but it also seems to have had the added effect of robbing Will of other emotions, such as happiness, enjoyment, and love, leaving him only with anger, resentment, disappointment, and an all-around negative buzz. Tonight, sit down. He's basically like Tuvok, except far less entertaining. Had I known this commendation entailed ritual humiliation, I might have declined. Along with a few other peeps from previous episodes, Shima Lalaland is back for another roasting, but this time I'm not sure how much blame he can shoulder, since Will apparently pulled up a co-director's chair and did half the work, including the acting direction for Jaden, some of which even seems to have made the final cut. You were not advanced to Ranger. I was not advanced to ranger. It's a depressing coming of age story where an underachieving Katai is treated as a subordinate by his stern military father. His love for his young son contingent on his ability to kill savage alien monsters. Will Katai manage the seemingly impossible feat of living up to a thousand plus year history of notable rages, not to mention his superstar father's impressive legacy. Wait, isn't this movie meant to be fictional? My wife would give a very interesting answer to that question. Yep, it's another Smith family double team, but this time Jaden takes the spotlight in the most cringeworthy example of Hollywood nepotism since The Pursuit of Happiness. Unfortunately, this movie seems more akin to The Pursuit of Morbid Depression, a strange opener which Smith Sr. intended to kick off a so-called 1000 AE universe, aspiring to the heights of Star Wars, the MCU, and the like, which we awkwardly know all about thanks to a data leak at Sony. Apparently, we've missed out on sequels, numerous TV shows, video games, theme park attractions, documentaries, a cologne and perfume line, an educational collab with NASA, a social media platform, and that's not even all of it. It seems like someone got a bit too carried away with a brainstorming session. Little did Will know all he was really doing was offering up his son for a mauling by a pedantic sci-fi fandom, predictably failing to live up to its theoretical potential. After Earth was a critical and commercial failure, earning a grand total of three Razzies and a disownment from Jaden. It appears you are in some doubt as to the wisdom of becoming a parent. Ultimately, Katai may have lived up to his father's mantle, but the only thing Jaden managed to ghost was his own Hollywood career. Welcome to Earth. It's a movie that fails to live up to its own premise in real life. This is a meta-level self-burn. Red alert. And so, with an unrealized franchise plot outline just lying around, they crammed an entire universe into a series of books, short stories, and a comic. And so, in the interest of thoroughness, I've skim read almost all of it. If that doesn't earn me a like and subscribe, then I don't know what will. Point one, the only reason the Novans haven't been wiped out is because their enemies are also a stupid advanced sci-fi civilization. So 900 years before the events of After Earth, in the year 100 AE, a bunch of humans arrive on Nova Prime to set up camp. 143 years later, some mysterious aliens who come to be known as the Skrull show up and sass the Novans good and proper, continuing to invade intermittently over the following centuries, eventually deploying the first generation of Ursa in the year 576 AE, which becomes their go-to tactic thereafter. They never resort to orbital bombardment, never 
drop ground troops and they never bring enough ships or ursa to finish off the humans, sometimes only dropping off a few dozen of these creatures at a time. The Skrau will often give the Novans a century or more to recover in between invasions. This is obviously not a strategy conducive to wiping out your enemies. The human race has a mere population of millions, it shouldn't be that hard to end them. Thanks to a few point of view chapters we get from the Skrull in the novels, or the Kreezatine as they call themselves, we gain a bit of insight into why these guys are resigned to tinkering around the edges. The Kreezatine themselves have a clawed, monstrous visage, living in a strict caste society permeated by sanctioned violence. They're almost as savage as their beasts. Their homeworld seems to be quite far away from Nova Prime, taking 19 years to travel there during the first Ursa dump. Yet despite this distance, the Skrull have a strong religious connection to Nova Prime, or Xanator as they know it, revering it as a sort of holy land their spirits must pass through before being accepted into the afterlife. So consequently, their invasion tactics are severely limited by their silly religious dogma. Setting foot on Nova Prime or damaging its surface are rather massive taboos. Even their precision air bombardments and use of Ursa was hotly contested in their society, only overridden by their desire to rid Nova Prime's surface of the humans, whose presence here is considered to be even more sacrilegious. The Skrull obviously need to just accept the reality of the situation and obliterate the Novans in one foul swoop. Every year they don't defeat them is another year the humans spread their reach and contaminate their holy land even further. Even after suffering numerous defeats over the years, the Skrull still seem to underestimate their enemies, considering humans to be little more than vermin. But if these supposed vermin are capable of repelling your forces consistently and dominating your holy land, then what the hell does that make you? Failing to even consider that opening lines of communication with the humans could be an effective solution. They're not to know this planet is ancient Skrull territory. Call a ceasefire, throw an ultimatum at them, give them a bit of a timeline. That would surely be a better option than more handicapped military offensives. But instead, the Ursa are considered the final solution to the Novan presence in their holy land. Pitting animals against animals has a certain elegance to it in their eyes. If only bad logic could win wars. The Ursa are quite simply predatory beasts. Although they do have some semblance of intelligence, in the long run they have no chance of defeating an intelligent technological civilization. Humans are a walking, talking mass extinction event. We could probably wipe these things out by complete accident. The Ursa are indeed powerful creatures, afforded extraordinary strength and damage resistance, in part thanks to the metal weaved into their flesh. But unfortunately they also have a few convenient weak spots on their backs and bellies. Was that really necessary to their design? But their most ridiculous vulnerability has to be their sensory perception or lack thereof. Like their creators, the Ursa are eyeless creatures, but unlike bats and the like, they really haven't made up for it with their other senses. Sensors. And the Skrull chose not to or weren't able to pass on their telepathic abilities to the Ursa forced to hunt using their sense of hearing, but primarily their sense of smell, which unfortunately for them is so highly specialized it greatly limits what sense they can actually pick up on. Human fear pheromones, it's the only smell they can hone in on, nothing else. All other smell input comes through to the Ursa as an indecipherable mess that doesn't tell them anything. These things designed specifically to kill humans can't even distinguish our other body odors, which makes even less sense when we consider later Ursa gens are equipped with predator-like camouflage. It seems the Ursa are forced to listen out for their enemies, then appear or roar to give them a bit of a fright, allowing the Ursa to more precisely nail down their position. So in other words, surprise attacks which would be best suited to camouflage are basically impossible. A silent human who isn't aware of the camoed Ursa's presence won't even register as a target. You could avoid these things entirely by just going to sleep with some good earplugs in. That's how you know your invasion's a failure, your troops have to literally trip over their enemies to find them. There is no definitive evidence to suggest that doing nothing will result in death. Not to mention smell and basic hearing aren't exactly the most precise of senses, making it extremely difficult for the Ursa to respond adequately to finer human movements. But why did the Skrull choose to forego the inclusion of eyes? Well, predictably, they see eyes as unholy sensory organs and visible light wavelengths as heretical. So again, they've diminished their military capabilities due to religious concerns, which is weird because these beasts are already in violation of their 
principles. They might as well have made these things as effective as they possibly could be. At least give them echolocation or something. Although the Skrull do make incremental improvements to the Ursa over the years. Even modern Ursa are afflicted with these highly exploitable weaknesses. Which luckily for the Skrull, the Novans only partially take advantage of. Both the Skrull and the Novans seem committed to a never-ending stalemate. In the Novans' case, their lack of military development and resignation to a perpetual defensive war saving the Skrull from ever truly being threatened. Point two, the Novans have imported many of Earth's societal problems, most notably their failure to progress in areas their survival counts on. So when the first frazzled humans arrived on Nova Prime after a hundred year journey in space, it's safe to say they were pretty scant on resources and short on manpower. To make things worse, resources on Nova Prime aren't as abundant as they were on Earth, so all things considered, it's understandable developing technology and infrastructure would be difficult. But in saying that, they seem to have enough resources to make all sorts of glorious tech, so these excuses only hold so much weight. Especially when it comes to later Novans who have vastly superior technology than their ancestors and a larger, highly militarized population. One thing that seems consistent to every generation of Novans though, these guys are all about making poor decisions. First off, the Novans seem to have thrown democracy and secularism to the wind, abandoning these fundamental cornerstones of the former free world in favor of a risky form of group dictatorship known as the Tripartite Agreement, whereby a religious leader, the Primus, a military leader, the Prime Commander, and a scientific leader, the Savant, are gifted absolute power to rule the population. Although this system is not ideal in general, obviously one of these leaders is not like the others. There's some pretty legitimate reasons why religion should be kept out of politics. Malleable religious beliefs can be twisted to fit any number of agendas, often with disastrous consequences. This savant is probably a welcome inclusion in this arrangement, but there's still just one person. And being a scientist is no guarantee of sound leadership, as we soon find out. Not to mention the concerns of legally gifting a military leader political power. They have the monopoly of force after all. For the longest time, the Novans didn't even have a dedicated police force despite being plagued by crime. This is a vulnerable system that seems almost doomed to fall into a singular dictatorship, or worse. And to make it all the more risky, twice in their history, a prime commander was empowered as the sole dictator of the Novans. But they were both rages, so I guess that's okay, they obviously had the good blood. During normal times, these three leaders spend their time squabbling over issues, until an inadequate consensus is reached, holding back their progress in extreme important areas, usually due to the Primus's political goals or religious beliefs. These guys have more in common with the Skrull than they realize. Over the years, their fragile political system has resulted in damaging political divisions, civil wars, and bad decision making in general. So guys, be sure to make good decisions, especially when it comes to your meals. Let's check out HelloFresh. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. With 50 weekly recipes and market items to choose from, you can spend less time preparing your meals and more time focusing on the work you really should be doing. Choose from a range of meal categories, including family-friendly, fit and wholesome, pescatarian and veggie options. Also look out for quick and easy meals, easy cleanup and low prep recipes. You can choose your weekly meals or if you like to live dangerously, let HelloFresh pick your meals from your preferred category. I found all HelloFresh meals delicious, the produce was top notch, and the recipes were easy to follow. HelloFresh is a great way to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. So go to HelloFresh.com and use code MEDIAZALAT16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. Check it out in the video description. That's HelloFresh.com and use code MEDIAZALAT16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise as gifts. The Novans' weird politics become even more inexcusable when we consider that despite having a military leader holding one third of all political power and living under the constant threat of Skrull invasion, they suffer from a woeful lack of military progress. Though we can forgive the Novans for their heavy casualties during the first Skrull invasion, they don't exactly help themselves in the following years. With a now adequate defense system able to defend against shielded Skrull ships, they never managed to actually find a Skrull in the flesh, dead or 
or otherwise. And they're definitely downing ships from time to time. They don't even seem to be clear on whether the Skrull dropships are autonomous or piloted. They've failed to learn almost anything at all about the Skrull since their first invasion 700 years ago. May we presume that this conflict is also responsible for the weakening of your powers. When the Ursa first arrived, the Novans weren't adequately prepared for any kind of ground offensive, heavily reliant on their pulsar energy weapons which they already knew weren't effective against the Skrull ships. So naturally, the Skrull had also designed the original Ursa to be highly resistant to them as well. That was predictable. Despite being at war for centuries, the Novans are said to have never developed a single new weapon for the Rangers in all that time. Resigned to weaponry, they already knew was close to useless against the Skrull. With heavy casualties mounting and unable to down a single Ursa, the Novans were on the verge of defeat, until they invented the Cutlass technology based on their Phoenix Cannon defense system, redeveloping smart metal projectiles into blades that can be reconfigured into various shapes, with a leading edge that can be as thin as one molecule, allowing it to cut through almost anything. Also worth noting, the Savant at the time shelved this idea in the middle of the war, despite having no other the good alternatives. It's only thanks to a young new Prime Commander, Connor Rage, that they even got these things. Bless those saintly Rages. Meanwhile, the Primus completely gives up the fight, interpreting their destruction by the Ursa as God's will. Though I would say the Cutlasses aren't a great long-term solution, anything capable of defeating the Ursa at that time was probably worth pursuing. But come on guys, going forward, you can do better than this. After 400 years of sporadic war against the Ursa, the Novans have developed an intimate understanding of their attributes and capabilities, yet they still haven't developed any effective military weaponry beyond the Cutlasses. Even the modern Rangers are usually getting dropped off by light vehicles or aircraft and then running around in battalions of eight. Though they're somewhat effective against the Ursa, they're constantly suffering heavy losses, which is concerning since the human population is still modest and most of these deaths are probably unnecessary. And the Ghosts aren't much help either, only seven other people aside from Willy Rage managed to develop the ability. Is a melee war against a vicious alien beast really the permanent go-to here? The Skrull are limited by their beliefs, but the Novans only seem limited by this weird Moby Dick theme they're forced to conform to, and so they're stuck with futuristic harpoons. Sure, the Phoenix defensive cannons can be dodged by the Ursa, but then the Rangers are still capable of striking Ursa with their equally ineffective energy weapons. I'm sure with a bit of ingenuity, they could develop new, more effective projectile weaponry. Explosives are shown to be somewhat effective against the Ursa. High caliber conventional firearms with explosive or armor piercing rounds could probably chip away at them. And let's not discount missiles, railguns, smart bullets, or even a handheld Phoenix projectile system, which was said to be difficult to develop 400 years ago under hellish war conditions. What on after earth have you guys been doing during these long stretches of peacetime? Dudes need to take a knee and have a serious think about this shit. Once you've developed Better weaponry, throw it on a tank, drone, or dare I ask for mech walkers. At the very least, mount it on your existing aircraft. And if you really have to run around with cutlasses, well, the painfully obvious solution is simple. Chuck on a sealed spacesuit or equivalent, and boom, the Ursa can't smell your fear pheromones at all. The strongest tactical move is always the one in which you will reap the highest gain at the lowest cost. The ghost just became obsolete. Later, Willy, how did no one think of this? And here I was wondering whether I should include this point. Maybe the Ursa can smell the most infinitesimally small trace of pheromone through a sealed suit. Somehow. But no. Nope, a big glass dome will do. Obviously, in time, you want to develop a streamlined combat suit designed to meet the needs of Ursa hunting. Their current supposed smart suits are good for many things, but protecting against Ursa attacks isn't one of them. They've seemingly chosen style over substance. My suit's turned black. I like it, but I think it's something bad. Simply masking human smell is a war-ending advantage that would also be afforded to you with any airtight vehicles, preferably quiet ones. The Ursa's claws are said to only be capable of scoring metal, though they can spew forth an acid-like black goo which could possibly get through armor. But hey, they'd have to stumble around until they find you first. You should have plenty of time to plug away at them with your improved weaponry. Though the Novans develop a bunker system for civilians later, basic armor is another obvious strategy they 
mostly fail to take advantage of. At no point throughout the series do they ever make any meaningful attempt to fortify their cities. I have found that most humans are less than meticulous when it comes to their domestic habits. This often results in the rangers being forced into tight urban combat, which ultimately wouldn't be necessary if they just put up a few perimeter walls with adequate defenses. But since you're letting these beasts gallop into civilian areas unimpeded, you might as well employ some better tactics. The Ursa's fixation on human fear pheromone can be utilized in other ways. Waft the stuff around and lure the Ursa into a trap, finish them off with mines or whatever good stuff you've got at hand. Other tactics at your disposal, considering the Ursa's sensitive hearing, sonic weapons could be worth a blast. Civilian Ursa hunters are seen using thermal imaging tech to spot Ursa, another obvious strategy the rangers don't seem to capitalize on. They've trapped themselves into a pattern of war where they only ever destroy the Skrull's frontline forces, a deadlocked conflict in which both sides are stuck making small but ultimately futile improvements to their technology and tactics. But hey, the Novans are an advanced sci-fi civilization as much as the Skrull. Why are their ships even allowed to invade Novan airspace? The Novans have had a system-wide satellite detection grid since the first Ursa drop. Though the Skrull have been able to get past it undetected numerous times over the years, the later Novans don't suffer from this issue. They detect the Skrull as soon as they enter the Novan system, yet are completely powerless to stop them before they reach Nova Prime. By choice, the Novans have been busy building a whole fleet of harmless transport ships. And the kicker is they were perfectly capable of building effective military vessels. Their idiot leaders just decided playing Pilgrim was more important than winning the war. Defending Nova Prime was the least of their priorities. This is a life-threatening situation and your attention should be focused on one thing alone. And so obviously, if they can't even extend their defensive perimeter to protect the civilian population, you just know taking the fight to the Skrull homeworld is far too much to ask for. But it should be somewhat plausible considering the later Novans have FTL wormhole tech which allows them to travel all the way to Earth almost instantaneously, a trip that originally took them a century. And from what we know, the Skrull leadership are indeed present at their offensives, often limping home once their primary forces defeated. At the very least, the Novans could devote some time and effort into capturing some Skrull, acquiring more intel or opening lines of communication. The Novans are still resolute in their claim to Nova Prime, yet they're not devoted enough to the war effort to ever come close to winning it. Since it's obvious the Skrull consider Nova Prime to be their territory, maybe at least consider other options. Do we really want never-ending warfare with one of the only other intelligent life forms out there? Is Nova Prime really worth holding on? To, especially when there is at least one viable alternative already within reach. Point 3. The Novans seem ignorant of the current conditions on Earth, failing to maintain a foothold on one of the only habitable worlds known to exist. Aside from Nova Prime, the Novans also occupy a series of small anchorages spread across the spiral arm of the Milky Way, leading like a trail of breadcrumbs back to their ancestral home. Unfortunately, none of these little colonies are located on habitable bodies, and despite the Novans regularly sending out probes, life-bearing or even semi-habitable worlds seem extremely scarce, which is precisely why the humans fleeing Earth had to settle for the not-so-ideal environment of Nova Prime. They've never found anything better than that, except for perhaps one very familiar world. Welcome to After. Earth. So in the year 1000 AE, with a confined Ursa in tow, we join father and son Rage on a bonding excursion to one of the Novans' backwater training facilities. But some mass expansion jazz hits hard, forcing them into a wormhole with a bunch of rocks, spitting them out way off course and heavily damaged on the doorstep of Earth. And then Will is like, oh no, we need to crash land anywhere but here. This place is dangerous. No, not here. Travel us again. You see the Novans have declared Earth a complete no-go quarantine zone. This planet has been declared unfit for human habitation. Placed under class 1 quarantine by the Interplanetary Authority. But Rage is out of options, so he crashes into Scary Danger Planet, now severely injured and in a fouler mood than ever. Despite this being a military transport vessel full of Rangers, they've predictably got nothing good in the way of weaponry beyond the Cutlasses. There aren't even any energy weapons to be found here. You never know what conditions you might encounter. 
you must be prepared for anything. And the rest of this junk seems pretty fragile for field gear. Also, their vessel appears to be constructed of whale bones, and I'll give you one guess as to why that could be. So with a smashed distress beacon, it's up to Katai to head out and find another beacon in the tail section. Will seems to know that Ursa probably survived, but plays down the risk to his son, perhaps in an effort to calm his nerves. There are three possibilities, the third and least likely. Is that it is up. But he already sabotaged that effort by wildly exaggerating the situation with the animals on this world. Everything on this planet has evolved to kill humans. It's not a great idea to be whipping up fear in the boy, especially with an Ursa lurking around. Admit it, part of you wants him to die for what he did. Okay, so creatures that have literally evolved without humans for 1,000 years have somehow evolved specifically to kill us. Right. But hey, Will is the prime commander. He holds a third of all governmental power. I'd say he's more than a reliable source. He should know a thing or two about Novan territory. So Will settles in for an easy shoot while Katai is sent out to conquer Hollywood. I mean, the wilderness. Rage Senior starts barking vague orders. It must be hard for Katai to decipher what his old man is on about at times. Recognize your power. This will be your creation. Will also seems to have missed that Katai is running around this hostile environment making heaps of noise. You wouldn't give any other ranger that order! When he's not running, sleeping, or kneeling, Katai has a series of encounters with the terrifying local fauna. We've got plain ass baboons with a bit of a winter coat, who probably would have been chill if Katai didn't smash a rock into their scout's face. We've got saber toothed tiger like big cats, not unlike those our primitive ancestors already survived, except without actual saber teeth. And we've got a big scary bird that turns out to just be Big Bird. And in the novelization, we find out that all of these big sookie animals, predator and prey alike, are snuggling together at night around the hot spots. These cuddly teddy bears are absolutely thriving, and the forests look lusher than ever. To be honest, this ecosystem seems to be doing far better than what we have on Earth right now. Sure, some environmental conditions here aren't that great. With low oxygen levels, the Novans now require assistance to breathe. But if our primate cousins can adapt to this environment, then I'm sure the Novans could as well. As for the big freeze each night, if a pile of sticks and a bit of bird love is enough to keep you alive out in the cold, well I'm sure little more than a shack and a blanket could do the job as well. And there are parts of Earth that apparently don't suffer this nightly freeze. And most of the planet freezes over completely at night. Also, at one point it actually rains at night, which should have been snow if the cold was really that extreme. Though it's debatable whether the Novans had good reason to completely abandon Earth, since large mammals appear to have survived here. Let's assume their exodus a thousand years ago was necessary, but nowadays this place seems pretty sweet, at least habitable enough to justify an outpost. They're already expending resources setting up facilities on far more inhospitable worlds, and they can seemingly travel to Earth in a flash. Maintaining a presence here is a complete no-brainer. May be crucial to the survival of your colonies. It would make sense to at least retain control of the planet considering the rarity of habitable worlds and the fact there are hostile aliens out there who might try to stake their claim, especially if there's no one there to challenge them. It's possible they could even adjust the atmosphere and get rid of this annoying nightly freezing cycle. But with all this vegetation and an ocean ecosystem healthy enough to support whales, oxygen levels should be set to increase. If their complete abandonment of Earth had something to do with preservation, then maybe I could have got on board with it. The Novans are in theory a bunch of space hippies supposedly learning from the mistakes of the past. By using renewable energy, being careful with their resources, and protecting the natural areas of Nova Prime, while also releasing a bunch of Earth animals into the Novan biosphere, which obviously isn't a great idea if you have conservation in mind. But I can't find any evidence that their quarantining of Earth has anything to do with their environmentalism. It just seems like they've incorrectly classified it. You are misconstruing the nature of this situation. And even if they had noble intentions, living on Earth is still a human birthright. They just need to apply their modern values and live on Earth with as little impact as possible. So after recovering another distress beacon from the tail section, Katai pulls a ghost out of nowhere and finally harpoons his white whale, earning his father's respect and a creepy once-in-a-lifetime chuckle. 
before heading back to Nova Prime. But apparently after After Earth, the Novans do eventually send a platoon of suitably adapted humans back here. Better late than never, I suppose. Suited to breathe the atmosphere, I mean. They're still just running around with swords. They just better hope the Skrull don't show up because this time they wouldn't have any problem unleashing their full military might against this world.